Our service continues on page 355 of the Red Book of Common Prayer. And just a reminder that all our service music is on the screen insert and in the front of your hymnal. So we will sing the period from there. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith, to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, with one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. A reading from the book of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Please stand and join me in saying the psalm today, responsibly, breaking at the asterisk. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All of you will take his line and give him glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor
poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him, my descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many generations, of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our sequence is seven hundred and seven.
You know, I'm not preaching on that last sentence, but, you know, Jesus, it's a hard enough gospel lesson to preach on, and then you have to go and talk about being ashamed of us if we deny you. <laughs> That'll be another time. That'll be another time. Maybe. <clears throat> so, several years, I love to read other people's sermons. I have, you know, I have the, a big, thick book uh, of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches and writings and sermons. I love to read them. And and there's a website you can go and actually listen because, you know, reading Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermons are about one-tenth of the experience itself. And same with uh, William Sloan Coffin, Bill Coffin. I I have a book, a two-volume set of his sermons. I love to read them. Um, And then others. In the Episcopal Church for a while, I don't know if they still do this, but every year they'd, uh, they'd publish a little book called Sermons That Work. And it was, uh, it was a collection of sermons that had won prizes in the Episcopal Church for, you know, best pastoral sermon, best prophetic sermon, uh, best funeral sermon, whatever. And I just love reading them. And I've got a book of um, sermons from uh, preachers from the African-American tradition, you know, to kind of just see how different people take uh, a text, but also just to read them for my edification. So I, um, in one book of sermons... Uh, uh, was this story I want to tell you. It was uh, about a husband and a wife who went to see their four-year-old son perform in the class Christmas pageant. And it was every bit as bad as those events can be. You know, sometimes they're cute and sometimes they're like, oh, this is not good. (laughs) Finally, near the end, the teacher who was in charge came out and said, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to get ready to have the manger scene sponsored by our four-year-old class. About that time, the lights dimmed, everybody looked up, and out from the corridor came not one, but three Virgin Marys. They marched out onto the stage, uh, spaced themselves around the straw, and as little kids do, they all looked for their parents until they found them and waved. Now, you may think it's strange that they're, they, to have three Marys, but over the years, the school had acquired three Mary costumes, and no one could imagine not using all of them. I know. Besides, this gave a chance for more children to be involved and kept down the squabbling about who got the really good parts. Following the Marys were two Josephs. They walked up behind the Marys, wandered around the straw, and found their places. Then 20 little angels came out in white robes with these huge gauze wings. They knew exactly where they were going and spaced themselves seemingly in perfect order. They were followed by 30 little shepherd's boys, dressed in burlap uh, and carrying all sorts of objects that were supposed to be crooks, right, and shepherd's, shepherd's hooks. Well, it was at this point that the problem occurred. During the dress rehearsal, the teacher had used chalk to draw circles on the floor where the angels were supposed to stand and crosses to mark the spots where the shepherds were supposed to stand. But the children had practice in their street clothes. So on the night of the pageant, when the angels came out walking with their beautiful but huge gauze wings, well, they stood in their cir- on their circles, but their huge gauze wings covered the crosses of the shepherds as well. So when the time came for the shepherds to find their places, they didn't know where to go because the angels were, took up all the space. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm quoting, okay? There was one little boy who became extremely frustrated and angry over the whole experience. He finally spied his teacher behind the curtains and shocked everyone when he said in a loud stage whisper, heard by everyone, because of these damn angels, I can't find the cross. (laughs) Yeah, you can only imagine the horror of his parents, right? Like, he didn't learn that at home, he didn't learn that at home, and his teacher. But the audience loved it. I mean, they loved it. Uh, And it might have actually been a little bit more accurate to the language of first century Palestinian shepherds. (laughs) Well, that little boy is not the only one who has lost sight of the cross. If we're honest, we must admit that most of us aren't looking for it, let alone looking to take it up, as Jesus instructs us to in this morning's gospel lesson. 
You know, we want our faith to be user-friendly. I mean, who wants to come to church on Sunday morning to hear about crosses and suffering and death? Don't we hear and experience enough of that through the week? Plus, one could argue that focusing on the cross, Jesus's or our own, isn't the greatest PR tool for the growing church. Can you imagine putting a new banner at the bottom of our sign out there that said, come, take up your cross and suffer with us? <laughs> Do you think that it would cause hordes of people to start flowing in who hadn't thought to flow in yet? One church I used to go to had as their slogan, a place to belong whoever you are, just as you are. And that's nice. It, 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 and one thing that it really conveys is God's unconditional love for us. Right? You will be accepted here, wherever you are, just as you are. But to me, at least, it implies that there's nothing left needed for us to do. There's not going to be any demands on us. There's not going to be any uh, thing that we're going to have to change if we want to follow this man, Jesus. That God isn't also calling us to become more fully who we were created to be. And that, that might include some major changes in our lives, including taking up a cross or two. You see, too many people today think we can have Christianity without the cross, in fact, too many churches are afraid to preach the cross because, look, our numbers are already dwelling. Let's not, like, give an excuse for more to go out the door. And so they try to make it light and fluffy to get people to come and then demand nothing in order to hope that they stay. Now, I'm not saying church can't be joyful. Oh, my gosh, church should be joyful, right? We're talking about resurrected life, new life. But to only kind of focus on that without giving the whole picture uh, would be not very truthful to our Lord. Um, as one uh, author who writes uh, about children's ministries writes, you know, no kiddie gospel, right? We think we're going to give a kiddie gospel to save kids from learning about the cross and the difficult things. We should offer the full gospel to all of us. I know a church in San Francisco called Glide Memorial Church, and it is a rocking place. At least it was when I visited there a couple times in the 90s. So the minister at the time, he's since retired, Cecil Williams, went there in the, in the 70s. It was, a, it was like a dying Methodist church. Um, it was right on the edge of the Tenderloin District, so just really rough, rough district. And the first thing he did was very controversial. He took down the cross in the sanctuary. There was this huge cross. He took it down saying that people dealt all week with crosses and burdens and suffering and that Sunday should be free of all that. And he had a point. Those that came to that church had difficult lives and, the, and he wanted them to experience resurrection, not death, on Sunday. This was his pastoral response to those who were already suffering greatly, week in and week out. But still, I, didn't, I don't think it has to be either or. I, and so in taking that cross off, I see his point, but the cross also means new life through death, not just death. This morning's message to take up our cross is not the same as suffering. For suffering happens to us. It isn't fair or understandable, and it isn't God's fault or God's doing. We get cancer. A child dies. Our house burns down. These aren't acts of God. They're a result of a fallen and broken world. So unlike suffering, when we take up our cross, we choose to do so. Jesus didn't say, deny yourself and accept the cross placed upon you. He said, take up your cross. Choose to take up your cross. You see, the cross for Jesus wasn't some burden he had to bear. It was something he chose because of his love for us. It was literally, yes, his instrument of death. And yet it was so much more. It was his deliberate choice of giving life his deliberate choice of ministering to our need of the truth about God. It was his deliberate choice for, to show us of our, our need for love, 
cost what it may. Taking up a cross for us as disciples means the deliberate choice of, of something actually we could avoid. To take up a burden which we are under no obligation to take up except the obligation of God's love in Christ. It means the choice of taking upon ourselves, if we feel God calling us to this, the burdens of other people's lives. Of putting ourselves without reservation at the service of Christ and preparing a way for the kingdom of God. Of putting ourselves in the struggle against evil, knowing that we could just as easily walk away but choosing not to, whatever the cross, whatever the cost. It reminds me, you know, I was uh, watching uh, TV this week, and uh, this one program had three of the high school students who survived the killings in Parkland, Florida. And you could really understand if they said, you know, we can't talk right now. We are mourning, we are wiped out, we don't know what happened, we're grieving. Please give us our privacy. You could totally understand that, right? And yet, they saw something that they could have more easily not done, but they knew they had to do it. They knew at this point they had to stand up, however they were grieving or whatever privacy they needed, for the sake of something bigger. They knew they had to stand up and do something and speak their mind. And I don't know if they're Christians or not, but they're doing the right thing. And that's what I'm talking about when we talk about taking up our crosses. And it's at this juncture in Mark's gospel uh, where literally Jesus turns around and sets his face, face towards Jerusalem. He's done with his ministry of healing and preaching in Galilee, and now he's heading to suffering and to death, and he knows it. And Peter doesn't want him to do that. And so he takes him aside and says, don't do that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, right? Not only will I have to undergo this, but if you want to be my disciples, you too need to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. If you want to save your life, Jesus says, you have to be willing to lose it. And it's not because we're masochists that we talk about taking up our crosses. It's because we know deep down that what Jesus is saying is true. If you are always trying to protect your life, you've already lost it. And if you are willing to give it away for something much bigger than yourself, you will save it. You will taste a life much sweeter than if you're always trying to protect it. That is precisely the paradox of experiencing abundant life. If you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you're willing to give it away, that's when you experience real life. And so at those moments when you find it tiring to consider the needs of others in a culture that rewards those who just look out after themselves, when you'd rather write off those who treat you badly rather than love your enemies, as Jesus commands us, when you hear a joke or a comment that you'd rather just let slide instead of finding a way to speak up, at those moments and moments like them, you are being given a choice to take up your cross or not. At that moment, we have to make a decision. Do I want to take the road that's wide and easy, as scripture says? Or do I trust Jesus when he says to take up my cross and follow him on the narrow road that leads to life, real life? We have these moments, opportunities really, all throughout the week, little or big, right? And Lent is a time to realize that our Christian life is all about recognizing and being aware of these opportunities in our daily lives and with God's help, choosing the way that leads to life. To choose the way that will make a way for the kingdom of God to get a glimpse, right? To enter in a little bit more. Or to choose the way that you know will help you become more fully who God created you to be. Or will help others become more fully who God created them to be. 
even though it might be difficult, even though it might lead to suffering of one kind or another, to choose the way that will help you and others be more fully who God created you to be and not to take the easy way out that will actually make you just less than God created you to be. And you'll, fe- you'll feel it. Jesus says honestly and openly, if you want to follow me, the path does lead to life, but only through the cross. See, there's no Easter without Good Friday. There's no new life without death to the old life. And the thing is, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He just asks us to be willing to work together to make this world a little better. To make us more fully who God created us to be and to help others do that as well. And this means taking up our crosses at times. Gladly and wholeheartedly choosing to serve in some way that you could have avoided. It doesn't mean being a doormat when you need to get out of a situation. And it doesn't mean putting up with something that you shouldn't have to put up with. It means recognizing that a certain situa- in a certain situation that the hard way is the right way and having the courage and the trust to do the right thing. And if it's frightening, which it might undoubtedly be, do what someone once said to me to do. Just say, Jesus, walk with me. And when you say that, you realize that he is already ahead of you, leading the way. Amen. Let us now stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nine Seed Creed found on page 358. We believe in one God. The prayers of the people this morning are Form 3, found on page 387 of your Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Rob, our bishop, for Nancy, our rector, for the people of St. Andrew's Manchester, where Bishop Hirschfeld is visiting this morning, and for their priest, Sarah Rockwell. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. 
We pray for the safe, safety and speedy return of those deployed in the armed services and for comfort for their families. We pray for all who work for peace worldwide. We pray for assurance and blessing to those looking for work and for their families. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray for those in need of healing and encouragement. For David, Aaron, Eileen, Lou, Pat, Eleanor, and Judy. And we pray for healing within ourselves and for those in our thoughts and hearts today. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light perpetual shine upon them. We pray for Bob Nazer and from the Book of Remembrance, Florence May Pearson Murray, Dorothy Hino, Paula Myaska. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly pride, city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Using the prayer on page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbor our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we know we repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be delighted in your will and walk in your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the peace. The peace of the Lord is always with you. And also with you.
We continue with Eucharistic Prayer A, found on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift your hands to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take Eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the remission of sins. Whatever you do, drink it. Do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please come. Prayer on page 365. Let us pray together. Eternal God, 
Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us down to the world of peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is 474, Lift High the Cross. Four seventy three. Four seventy three.